Hello, everyone, and welcome to Medford Anywhere Learning TV. We're glad you're tuned in. We want to give a shout out to our friends at Southern Oregon PBS, KTVL, KDRV, and the Dove Network. Thank you for hosting us on your station. In the Medford School District, we have one shared vision, and that we believe that all are learning, and learning is for all. What better place to do that than right here on Medford Anywhere Learning TV? Hi, I'm Anna from Jackson County Library Services. I'm excited to be here today to share some great books with you. And I'm not here to tell you you should read any of these books, but I'm going to give you little teasers about them so you know if it's something you might want to pick up and read this summer. Now, most of these books are suggested for grades 4 to 6 or grades 5 to 8, with a couple of younger ones thrown in as well. And you can get all of these books at any of the Jackson County Library branches. And most of them are also available from the library's digital collection, so as ebooks or downloadable audiobooks. Okay, this first one I'm going to start with is called The Strangers. It's by Margaret Peterson Haddix. It's the first in the Greystone Secrets series. And this is a thriller. It kept me awake until one in the morning because I absolutely had to find out what was going to happen. So there are three kids in the Greystone family. There's a second grader named Finn, a fourth grader named Emma, and a sixth grader named Chess, short for Rochester. Now, usually when the kids get home from school, their mom is really eager to see them. And she takes a break from her work. She asks them about their day. She might even bake chocolate chip cookies. Today, though, when the kids get home, their mom doesn't come swooping out to give them a hug. They have to track her down, and they find her in the kitchen. Her back is to them. She's staring at her laptop screen, and she's clutching the kitchen counter like she needs it to hold her up, and she's whispering, no, no. Now, a moment later, she realizes the kids are home, and she immediately puts a smile on her face and pretends like everything's fine, and she goes to shut down her laptop but Chess stops her. And so the kids see the news report that so shocked their mom. Three kids have just been kidnapped. A second grader named Finn, a fourth grader named Emma, and a sixth grader named Rocky, short for Rochester. A thousand miles away in Arizona, there are three siblings with the exact same names and birth dates as the Greystone kids, and they've just been kidnapped. But it's just a coincidence, right? A really, 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 really strange coincidence? The Greystone kids themselves aren't in any danger, or are they? This is The Strangers by Margaret Peterson Haddix, the first in the Greystone Secret series. Next, we'll do Pugs of the Frozen North by Philip Reeve. Now, I think most of you probably know what pugs are. They're not this really big dog. They're a really small dog, right? So the Great Northern Race is not an ordinary dog sled race. It happens only once a generation, and the prize is remarkable. The first team to make it to the Snowfather's Palace at the top of the world gets its greatest wish granted. Now, the previous winner became enormously rich. Shen and Sika want to win the race to help Sika's grandpa get well again. And they have an old sled and a team of dogs. But these are not your usual big sled dogs. These are pugs. They have a team of 66 teeny tiny pugs to pull their sled. And it works. But when they see the competition they're up against, they're not sure they have a chance of winning. We can see here, Professor Shackleton Jones, he shows up with an ultra lightweight sled pulled by robot dogs. Helga Hammerfest has harnessed her sled to her two pet polar bears. Now Mitzi Von Prim, she actually does have huskies, but she has clipped them to look like poodles and dyed them pink to match her racing outfit. But worst of all is Sir Basil. He is the son of the previous winner, and he is determined to win this race no matter what it takes, even if it means he has to cheat. So Shen and Sika have an adventure coming, one that will involve danger, 
and detours, and even, take a look at this, a Yeti noodle bar. So think Bigfoot eats pasta. So for the fun and funny pugs of the frozen north, that is a book by Philip Reeve. The next one here is called From You to Me by K.A. Holt. It's been three years now since Amelia's older sister, Clara, drowned, and it still hurts every single day. Amelia's starting eighth grade now, and she tells herself she's the new Amelia. She's not going to burst into tears every time she opens her mouth anymore. In homeroom on the first day of school, the students are given letters that they wrote on the first day of sixth grade, letters they wrote to their eighth grade selves. Only, instead of being handed her own letter, Amelia is accidentally given the letter that her sister wrote. Clara died the summer before her own eighth grade year. Amelia's hands shake as she reads what her sister hoped to accomplish by the end of middle school. She can almost hear her sister's voice in her head as she reads, One, be nicer to Mom and Amelia. Two, get on the softball team. Three, ask Billy to a dance. Four, throw an awesome birthday party at the lake. Five, plan the most epic eighth grade prank ever. The only one of these that Clara had the chance to do was that birthday party on the lake, the day that ended everything. Now, Amelia thought she knew everything about her sister, but here was a side of her she doesn't recognize. Did she really care that much about softball? And who was Billy? Amelia decides she wants to find out why these things were important to her sister. She's going to try to do the things on that list that her sister never had the chance to do. This is From You to Me by K.A. Holt. All right, this next one is called Moto and Me by Susie Esterhaas. This is nonfiction, so it is a true story. So when Susie, the author, was a kid, she told her mom that when she grew up, she wanted to go live in a tent in Africa. And she did. She became a wildlife photographer, so someone who takes pictures of wild animals. And she lived in this tent in Kenya uh, for three years on a wildlife reserve. So this is in, in Eastern Africa. And while she was there, one of the park rangers asked if she would help raise an orphaned serval, a mid-sized wildcat. And she said yes. And she named the kitten Moto. And the kitten was just about two weeks old when she got him. And he needed a lot of care. So she was bottle feeding him night and day. She was grooming him with a toothbrush. And he was too little to be left alone at the beginning, so she carried him everywhere in a little kangaroo pouch. And most importantly, she was also helping him learn the skills that he would need to be able to survive in the wild. So here is Moto learning how to hunt on poor Mr. Ducky. That is Moto and Me, My Year as a Wildcat's Foster Mom by Susie Esterhaas, also with photographs by the author. My next one is called New Kid, and this is a graphic novel by Jerry Craft, and this has gotten a lot of buzz this year. It won the Newbery Award, and it's also been a real top favorite for a lot of kids. So this is how Jordan Banks feels pretty much every day, like he is falling without a parachute. Now, he really wanted to go to art school. Uh, he loves to draw, especially cartoons and uh, about events from his life. But his parents thought that that would be a waste because he's smart academically too. So instead of art school, Jordan is starting seventh grade across the city at the Riverdale Academy Day School. And we can see what it looks like here. Looks something like this. Um, it's one of the best schools in the entire state. Most of the kids who go there are really pretty rich, but Jordan is there on a scholarship. Now Jordan's up against all the usual challenges of starting a new school, finding the right classrooms, making friends, having someone to sit with at lunch. 
but he's also one of the few kids of color in his grade. Now, Jordan, he starts out feeling pretty lost and alone, but he doesn't plan on being just the new kid forever. So that one is New Kid by Jerry Craft. If you like fun and funny books, you might want to try something by Gordon Corman. He has written a bunch of books, including this one called Restart. Chase Ambrose falls off a roof the summer before eighth grade. He is in a coma for four days, and when he wakes up, he has no memory of his life before the accident. Here's what he learns about himself in the days and weeks before school starts. First of all, he is a great athlete. There are trophies and newspaper clippings all over his bedroom. Second, he has two best friends, Aaron and Bear. And there's a photo on his phone of the three of them together, and they're grinning like crazy. And they're holding a baseball bat with the remains of some kid's Halloween pumpkin smashed on the end. Third, he has some enemies. Now this, he figures out the, the day he smiles at a girl, and she immediately marches over and dumps her vanilla frozen yogurt on his head, chocolate sprinkles and all. Now, Chase's mom fills him in on a lot of things, but he can't shake the feeling that she's leaving something out, that there's something about his life that she doesn't want him to know. That is Restart by Gordon Corman. This one is The War That Saved My Life by Kimberly Brubaker Bradley. Ada was born with a club foot, which means it kind of twists in on itself and she can't walk. She gets around her family's one-room apartment, scooting, sitting down. And she loves to go over to the window and look out. They live three stories up above the streets of London. Ada's mother doesn't let her leave the apartment, ever, not even to go to school. In 10 years, Ada has never been allowed outside. And then the war comes. This is World War II. Hitler is taking over Europe, and the British expect that Germany will start bombing London soon. And so the kids in the city are being sent to the countryside. They have to go live with total strangers, but at least they'll be safer than they would be in the city with the war going on. Ada's little brother, Jamie, is getting evacuated with the rest of the neighborhood school kids, but their mom sees no reason for Ada to go. But Ada is determined to go with her little brother, even if it means sneaking past her mom and getting herself to the gathering point on her useless foot. So think about it. Everything that Ada knows about the outside world comes from either looking out that one little third-story window or talking to her six-year-old brother. There are so many things she's never seen or even heard of, like the ocean, trees, grass. She didn't realize anyone had enough to eat, and she never imagined there could be a woman named Susan who doesn't want two kids from the city living with her but who just might get Ada her first pair of crutches and even teach her to read. So that one's The War That Saved My Life, and there's a sequel to this one, and it's called The War I Finally Won, two of my favorite books. Next, I have an adventure. This is The Wolf Wilder by Catherine Rundell. In Russia, wealthy families used to keep young wolves as pets. A wolf in the house was thought to bring good fortune. But wolves aren't exactly like dogs. They're wild animals. They can't be kept indoors week after week, month after month, without the chance that that animal might go a little bit mad. And there could come a day when the wolf happens to nibble off someone's fingers or toes or ears, and then the family has to decide what to do with it. They can't kill it. That would bring bad luck. So often, the wolf would be packed off to a wolf wilder. Now, these are kind of rugged people who lived at the edge of the wilderness. They would take in the wolves, teach them how to hunt, how to howl, and how to avoid humans so that, that they could be released safely into the wild. Theodora and her mother are two such wolf wilders. Theo learned how to howl before she learned how to talk, and wolves make sense to her in a way that people don't. Now, it's true they both have their fair share of scars, but 
they liked their life. Then one day, an army officer by the name of General Rakov shows up and tells them they may no longer release the wolves into the wild. From now on, they are supposed to shoot any wolf that's brought to them. Fio and her mom don't know what to do. There's three wolves there that consider Fio as part of their pack, and there's a new little wolf pup, all black with white paws. They can't kill those animals, and they don't. They keep on wilding the wolves until they're caught. This time, General Rakov arrests Fio's mother and burns their house to the ground. Fio herself is lucky to escape. It's only thanks to her new friend Ilya that she does. Fio, Ilya, and four of the wolves you know, set out to try to rescue Fio's mother. It's not going to be an easy journey. And yes, General Rakov is coming after them. That is The Wolf Wilder by Catherine Rundell. Next for you, I've got this one called Blended. This is by Sharon Draper. Isabella hates Sundays. Even when she's a wrinkled old woman, Sundays will remind her of exchange day. So her parents are divorced, and she switches house every week. And her parents barely even nod at each other when they do that handoff at the mall every Sunday, 3 p.m. sharp. Isabella's mom is white. Her dad is black. Her mom lives in a small house, works at a restaurant, and likes to wear funny t-shirts. On mom weeks, Izzy practices piano on a portable Casio keyboard. And she often goes bowling or gets pizza with her mom and her mom's boyfriend, Mark. Isabella's dad works as a high-powered lawyer for a bank. He always wears nice suits, even on the weekends. On dad weeks, Isabella practices on a Steinway grand piano at her dad's house. And she often goes out shopping with her dad or out to get ice cream with her older, soon-to-be stepbrother, Darren. Now, Isabella likes both sides of her family. She really does. But she hates being split in half. It's like she's the tug-of-war piece between her mom and her dad. And they're getting along with each other worse than ever. That one is Blended by Sharon Draper. All right, I've just got one last book for you. And this one is Ghost by Jason Reynolds. So his name is Castle, but he prefers to be called Ghost. And he's a fast runner. He learned to be the night his dad tried to shoot him and his mom. His dad's in prison now, and his mom works really long hours at the hospital. So Ghost is on his own a lot. One day, he sees a track team practicing at the park. And he thinks it's kind of funny, because running was never something he had to practice. So he goes over to check out what's going on. And he sees there's a cluster of moms there cheering. There's a coach who looks like this bald, chip-toothed turtle. And there are a couple dozen kids decked out in running gear, good running shoes. Turns out this is the best youth track team in the city. Now Ghost watches for a while. They have their warm-ups, some timed runs, some races. And there's one kid, a sprinter, the coach calls Lou, who seems to think he's unbeatable. And his mom is there, and she's like cheering him on, jumping up and down, even when he's just doing warm-ups. And the coach, he keeps saying things like, Lou's the one to beat. Lou's still the one to beat. And Lou is fast. Ghost is impressed watching him run. But the way he's swaggering around like he's the best thing in the world and all that fuss being made over him totally rubs Ghost the wrong way. So the next time that Lou lines up to run, Ghost goes over and lines up beside him. Not on the track, but on the grass right next to him. And he rolls up his jeans, tucks his laces into his high tops, and he's ready to go. Of course, the coach is like, kid, what are you doing? Tryouts were last week. And Lou, he looks him up and down and says, yeah, the track is for runners, not for people who want to pretend like the runners. Ghost says, just blow the whistle. And the coach gives him one run. So on your mark, get set, and the whistle goes off. I wish I could tell you what I was thinking, but I can't. I probably wasn't thinking nothing. 
just moving. Man, were my legs going. I pumped and pushed, my ankles loose and wobbly in my sneakers, my jeans stiff and hot, the whole time seeing Lou out the corner of my eye like a white blur. And then it was over, and everybody watching, all the other runners clapped and hooted, pointing at us both. Some had their mouths open. Others just looked confused. Lou walked in circles with his hands on his head, trying to catch his breath, panting, wheezing out, who won? Who won, coach? That is Ghost by Jason Reynolds, and there are actually four books in this track series. Okay, so those are some book ideas, and now uh, you'll get some great information on how to join the library's summer reading program. Thank you. Hi, my name is Briston Strong, and I am the Youth Services Coordinator for Jackson County Library Services, and I am here to talk to you about the 2020 Jackson County Summer Reading Program. The summer reading program was initially designed to encourage kids to continue reading during the summer. This avoids what is referred to as the summer slide, when reading comprehension and thus reading levels tend to slip a little during the summer, causing kids to have to catch up the next school year. And while that is still a primary focus, the summer reading program has evolved and grown into an all-ages reading program that encourages people to connect with books, programming, and of course, their local libraries. So what can you expect this year from the summer reading program? First, the biggest change is digital tracking. On June 6th, you'll head to our website, www.jcls.org, and sign up for a Beanstack account. All you need to sign up is an email address and a library card. And if you don't have a library card, that's okay, because you can just sign up for one at home through our website. Beanstack is a digital reading tracking tool. Schools and libraries all over the country use it. Um, there you can log how many books you read, how long you read for, and even write reviews for your favorite or least favorite books. You can register yourself or your entire family. You can also expect programming. We have two different ways to experience programming this summer. One is through Zoom. You may be doing that already, but we'll be having trivia nights, book discussions, and more through the comfort of your own home using Zoom. And we also have take and make programs. These are programs that you can pick up at your local library during the second or fourth weeks of June, July, and August. These are hands-on activities that don't always require a screen. Lastly, you can expect prizes. We'll be giving out weekly prizes as well as grand prizes for readers of all ages. And like I said before, we have something for everyone in your entire family. If you have a little one between the ages of zero and five, sign them up for the summer reading early learning event. The early learning event is for your littlest readers, so all those bedtime stories and digital, digital story time books, those all count. For kids ages 6 to 12, we have two different options. You can track each individual book you read, or you can track by how many minutes a day you're reading. So whether you are just cruising through the Magic Treehouse series, or really taking the time to savor one of those book, read, uh, book talk books, then we have something for you. For teens, we want to hear your opinions. We want you to write reviews of programs that you attend or books you read. So if you came in first in the trivia night, we want to know about it. And if you picked up a book where the cover looked really cool, but the pages inside were a snore, we want to hear about that too. And adults, don't forget to track your reading too, because you can also be eligible to win prizes. So the summer reading program, just so you can save the date, starts on June 6th and goes all the way to August 15th. If you need more information, head to our website. Again, that is www.jcls.org. There you can see how to sign up for Beanstack and check out our programming calendar. In case you are wondering what to start with this summer, I'm going to suggest one of my favorite books, Small Spaces by Katherine Arden. You can hear a book talk for this title on our website also from Anna Maunders, but I'm going to give you just a little bit more of a teaser for it today. So the premise of this book is that 11-year-old Ollie finds a disheveled, weeping woman um, by the river, and she's threatening to throw a book into the river. So Ollie, of course, runs up, takes that book from her. There's more to it. I'll let you listen to that book talk. But what I'm going to do for you today is I'm going to read a little bit of that book that Ollie took from that old lady. My dearest Margaret, it starts. I wish I could have told you the story in person. More than anything, I wish I had one more hour, one more day, a little more time. But I don't. This, these words are all I have. I know you have often wondered why I do not speak of your father. I'm going to tell you why. 
I do not know if you will believe me. Set down in black and white, I barely believe these words myself. But I promise you that everything I say in here is true. Once you have read, I hope you will forget. The farm is yours now. Sell it if you can. Above all, I beg you to leave the past alone. Think of the future. Think of your family. Do not go back to Smoke Hollow. The twilights when the mist rises, the dangerous nights, get more frequent as the year draws to a close. Jonathan told me that before he, well, I will come to that. I can't tell you how I have thought of leaving this place. I meant to, you know. Your father and I even talked about it. But he said the curse was his alone, and he could not escape it. I would not leave him, and now he is gone. There, the candle is guttering, lights flicker, you know, when they are near. Sometimes I hope desperately that Jonathan is with them, that he has never left me at all. But mostly I hope he is safely dead, and that I will see him in the next world. Because the alternative is so much worse. God bless you, my dear. Even if this story seems strange, I beg you will read it, for my sake. With all my love, Beth Webster, Smoke Hollow, 1895. But there was more. There was an epigraph. When the mist rises and the smiling man comes walking, you must avoid large places at night. Keep to small. That was an excerpt from Small Spaces by Catherine Arden. And again, thank you for watching us here on Medford Anywhere Learning TV. Thanks for tuning in to Medford Anywhere Learning TV. Medford School District is a place where all are learning, and learning is for all. Welcome, bienvenidos a Washington Elementary in beautiful Medford, Oregon. My name is Gloria Pereira Robertson. Come inside. Everyone's welcome in my school. So, are you ready to hear about all the hats I wear in public education? First, I'm the proud daughter of Mexican immigrants. I'm also a first generation Ameri Mexican American. I'm also the 2017 Oregon State Teacher of the Year. I'm also an NEA Teaching Excellence recipient. I am here today to talk about something that is very dear to my heart because as an English language learner and a bilingual kindergarten teacher, let me tell you, I understand the struggles, the anxiety, the isolation, the harassment that English language learners suffer everywhere across the country. Being able to communicate in English gives English language learners a voice, a voice to communicate their basic needs, a voice to develop and build relationships, a voice to ask questions in order to build comprehension skills, a voice to be able to achieve in this country. How do we engage and empower English language learners in our schools in order to overcome the obstacles of the language barrier? This year, I created a partnership with Google and I have started a pilot program in Glen Falls, New York to use Google Translate in the classroom as a tool to empower English language learners to find their voice. This pilot will give access to English language learners to curriculum and building relationships with students that they never had a chance to do before. My idea will allow these students to communicate and work with English-only students and their teachers, something that wasn't really happening before using this tool. This concept will help make learning more inclusive and equitable for all our ELL students. With your help, we will boldly go where no one has gone before. You will see how using Google Translate can change the mindset of all students and educational staff by bringing empathy and understanding to what our English language learners have been dealing with for so many years. So please, help them find their voice. Help them find the tools that they need in order to communicate so they too can be found in translation.